I'm going to just read the opening because it sets it up for you. You can kind of read along with me. Um, running through the various layers and strata of the New Testament gospel traditions is a complex set of messianic titles or designations against which the careers of both John the Baptist and Jesus are tagged and evaluated. Remember that? Like, who do people say that I am? And so forth. In the climactic exchange at Caesarea Philippi, the mark on Jesus puts it most bluntly. Who do people say that I am? It's Mark 8, 27. The possibilities subsequently enumerated appear earlier in Mark when Herod Antipas hears of the powers, quote unquote, at work in the career of Jesus. And rumor has it that he might be John the Baptist, quote, raised from the dead, or Elijah, or one of the prophets of old. So this stuff is floating around in the air. I read Josephus to you a little bit yesterday, book two, and we've got this whole series of messianic figures arising from the death of Herod the Great up through the Roman Revolt. There's a half dozen to a dozen of them, and probably more that we don't know of. Each of these possibilities are implicitly rejected by Mark as Peter makes his definitive, though at this point, misguided declaration. The reason it's misguided is he doesn't understand. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Some of you know Mark well enough to know that's tricky for students. They get all excited. Peter finally sees it. No, he doesn't see it. He's actually on the side of the devil in confessing Jesus as the Messiah. But you have to understand that. The reader is clued into the mystery of who Jesus is, Jesus Christ, verse 1. On trial before the high priest, the question is put even more directly. Uh, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus answers, I am. But then couples his affirmation with the added declaration. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Presumably based on a combined reading of Daniel 7, 13 through 14, Psalm 110, and possibly Psalm 2. Earlier, when Jesus is glorified on the high mountain, just following Peter's declaration, the disciples ask in response to the experience of the kingdom of God coming with power, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus implies that the recently executed John the baptizer is indeed the Elijah to come, based on Malachi 4.5, but was rejected and killed based on what was, quote, written of him. Similarly, in John's Gospel, the baptizer is asked by the Jerusalem religious establishment, now this is the Gospel of John, who are you with the suggested possibilities, uh, the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet? John denies all three and declares himself the voice of one crying in the wilderness, based on Isaiah 43. And then we have, I'm not going to read anymore, just kind of skirt down, Luke 7, 20. Are you the one, John's in prison, are you the one or should we look for another? And then in a related Q pericope, he says that, yes, John's a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. And then he quotes the Malachi uh, Malach and also Isaiah 42, I mean uh, 40 verse 3. So, as you saw yesterday, these texts and some of these materials are echoed in the Qumran material and Dead Sea Scrolls, particularly in the sectarian literature. So here's the uh, classic paragraph that sets the thing up. For over a hundred years now, these materials have presented scholars of the New Testament with the classic form of the proverbial chicken or the egg question, okay? Do our gospel traditions import and impose these textual categories onto the figures of John and Jesus long after their deaths as a kind of exegetical or scribal enterprise to explain and justify the shocking and wholly unexpected facts of their deaths? That is the beheading of John and the crucifixion of Jesus. So that would be one position. By far the majority, this would be Crossan, Bart Ehrman, and everybody else you could name that works in the field of Jesus studies. In other words, what they most expected to happen didn't happen. That is Jesus being inaugurated as king, overthrowing the Romans and setting up the kingdom. And what they least expected did, that he's crucified, that John's beheaded, that it's all over. So what they do is they run to the texts of scriptures 
and find places where this was supposed to happen, and then they impose those predictions into the mouths of Jesus, particularly, so that he seems to know his fate ahead of time. So that would be the standard position of the scholars. You would expect scholars to take that position because they don't believe in prophecy, right? So if Jesus says in Mark 8, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested and spit upon and killed, and I'll rise the third day. He clearly didn't say that, but Mark saying that, imposing upon him, you follow, after the fact, that sort of construct. Now, or is it remotely possible, or even probable, that figures such as John, Jesus, and for that matter, a whole host of late Second Temple Jewish Palestinian Messiah figures, and then I list some of them for you that we covered yesterday, Qumran's teacher, Judas the Galilean, Ethranges, the shepherd king, Simon the Perean, he's the after three days you will rise guy, uh, the Samaritan, unknown, but unnamed rather, uh, Thutis and the Egyptian, uh, two of those are mentioned in the book of Acts. Remember, uh, I think it's the Samaritan or, or the Egyptian, I forget, that takes a bunch of people to the Jordan River and then goes, open Jordan, and nothing happened and the Romans come down and wipe them out. Uh, so is it possible that a whole host of these uh, figures might have derived their self-identity and also, also, that needs fixing, a self-propelled career pattern based on the reading of prophetic messianic texts? So do you see the issue? The issue would be, did things happen to the figure and then the followers went to the text and justified what happened? You got to find an answer. Our guy's killed. Dead messiahs, right? And yet, hey, wait, in Zechariah there's something about smiting a shepherd. Oh, this was predicted. The shepherd's supposed to be smitten. That would be one view. And let's put that back in the mouth of the teacher so he won't be ignorant of his own fate. After all, he's the Son of God, or he's being anointed by God. Or, the other view, that the figure is reading the text and saying, that's me. I'm the shepherd. You know, as I understand God's will, I'm to be smitten. You see the difference? Now, the minority, the minority of scholars uh, that's like me, Michael Wise, and Israel Knoll. <laughs> I think we're three. There might be a few others. Maybe Tina will join us if she hasn't already. Would, would say, let's don't reject the latter possibility. The former is just too easy to jump on. Um, look at what Schweitzer says here. Albert Schweitzer, Hugh Schoenfeld, and others uh, who are popular writers, particularly Schoenfeld, did think, I mean, Schoenfeld would be the ultimate advocate of the of the following the plan scenario, right, to the point that Jesus even faked his death, which I think is ridiculous. But I do like the idea, if you read his book, it's well worth reading the Passover plot, that 1960s bestseller. He shows all the texts that Jesus could have read and began to then think, this has to be my fate because there I am mentioned in this text, in this text, in that text. Okay? Schweitzer says, I can't resist putting this quote in because it's Schweitzer's greatest quote, I think. The Baptist appears and cries, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is my Schweitzer voice. Soon after that comes Jesus, and in the knowledge that he is the coming Son of Man, lays hold of the wheel of the world to set it moving on that last revolution, which is to bring all ordinary history to a close. It refuses to turn, and, throw, and he throws himself upon it and is crushed. Now I'm going <laughs> to, I just think that's so incredible. And then what does he do? He quits his position as professor at Basel, goes and gets an MD degree, and takes his organ, because he loves his music, to Africa and spends the rest of his life uh, as a vegetarian with a pet goose uh, that he claimed was more intelligent than some of his relatives, <laughs> and, <laughs> and wrote uh, for world peace and nuclear disarmament and so forth. Anyway, Schweitzer would say to follow Jesus, you live like Jesus. Uh, you throw yourself on that wheel. Uh, then you can read through all this. Um, now, then I get to two books, and I'll pause here where you can note these down, but you're all going to print this and read it. 
1999, it's funny how great ideas come in clusters. This is true in science. You know, so many discoveries. You have two people in different continents within a week or two come up with something. There's some like holy spirit of scientific discovery or something. I don't know how it works. But anyway, I was given two pre-publication book manuscripts. I blurb both of the books on the back. People love me to blurb their books because I'm always very extravagant. You notice with Gibson. I mean, if I don't like the book, I'll say, you know, you probably get somebody else. To, but if I like it, I, I, I try to really say, this is the greatest book ever. Well, Michael Wise, the first Messiah investigating the Savior before Christ. I still think it's the best book on the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, in terms of the messianism. It's almost like a novel. If you can get a copy, grab it. I think it is probably out of print. I absolutely love the title. I remember when he called me and told me, I'm going to do a book. I got the title. I knew what it was about. <clears throat> it's about the teacher of righteousness that we discussed yesterday. But to call it the first Messiah, this is so brilliant. It didn't become a bestseller, and I was so surprised because I thought if you were browsing a bookstore and you had any interest in this and you saw a book called The First Messiah, are you not going to pull it down and at least like, The First Messiah? Whoa, who's that? It's a wonderful book. The other by Israel Knoll that I mentioned yesterday, this is his other book, The Messiah Before Jesus. Well, that too, I think, is a nice grabbing title. Both books I would highly recommend. They have different theses, but independently, I mean, they have different details, but independently, they argue the same thesis that the Qumran teacher read himself into the Thanksgiving hymns. The Thanksgiving hymns are so important. Again, Cave One, jar, that jar. Remember what I said yesterday about Cave One? I mean, if you read the Community Rule of Damascus document, the Thanksgiving hymns and Habakkuk Pesher, you've just about got the whole worldview of the sectarian community. And then you can add other things. So what are the Thanksgiving hymns? A lot of them in the middle we think are autobiographical. It would be like having writings from Jesus where in the first person he said, O oh Lord, I look to you in the morning. My enemies surround me like dogs, like a lion, they're nipping at my feet, or something like that. You know, that, and it was actually from Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that's what we have from the teacher. It's the most valuable material on the planet for people studying the self-consciousness of a Messiah, because we've got a guy writing in the first person. And again, I'm using Messiah in the general sense, not just the Davidic Messiah. By the way, this guy claims to be anointed of the Spirit, Isaiah 61.1. Jesus also is said by Luke to be anointed of the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. So to be anointed of the Spirit is higher than being anointed by oil. And the Messiah has two helpers, right and left hand, remember? Will you at this time restore the kingdom? Who's going to sit at your right and left hand? So the middle figure is anointed by the Spirit. Why is he anointed by the Spirit? Because nobody could anoint him. Samuel is anointed by the Spirit. He anoints David. You see the idea? So the, there are three figures, the prophet and the two messiahs. This idea we know in the scrolls, but it's also in the Hebrew Bible. Zechariah talks about the two anointed ones who stand before the Adon of the whole earth. The Adon of the whole earth is the middle figure. He's a human being. But he's so full of the Spirit that he basically runs the show on earth. He's almost Yahweh on earth. He's very close to that, as I'll show you in a minute. But he's, you wouldn't pray to him. You wouldn't make him your God. God is still your God. But you're certainly happy to have him because, as it says about the teacher, to him God has made known, made known all the mysteries of the prophets. So this guy knows it all. And you can remember, read speedily while you're running, if you're listening to him, because you've got the Cliff Notes Deluxe. You know, you've got everything. You've got all the interpretations. Okay? So in the Thanksgiving hymns, we have this figure, the teacher, self-consciously finding himself in texts of the Hebrew Bible that involve suffering and dying, including Isaiah 53. He quotes Isaiah 53. 
and he says, my life is going to be poured out as, as an offering. So he has this idea of dying for the sins. Remember, um, in Habakkuk Pesher, we read yesterday, how will you be saved? The just will live by faith. Interpreted, this means to have faith in the teacher of righteousness and to not give up on the vision. So, uh, anyway, if you read Wise and Knoll, uh, you will get many more details. Now, here's Boltman, who's wrong. <laughs> uh, to quote Boltman again, Of course, the attempt is made to carry the idea of the suffering Son of Man into Jesus' own outlook by assuming that Jesus regarded himself as Deutero, Isaiah's servant of God, who suffers and dies for the sinner, and fused together the two ideas, Son of Man and Servant of God, into the single figure of the suffering, dying, rising Son of Man. At the outset, the misgivings which must be raised as to the historicity of the predictions of the Passion speak against this attempt. Look, if I were writing in the 1920s, I would have probably said that too, so I'm not going to fault Boltman so much. He's trying to get people out of a fundamentalist, conservative, literal reading of the text and allow them to have a little bit of critical finesse. But now that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we got a case. See, we've got like a case that shows that it ain't necessarily that way, that, that figures do read texts. And we're not talking about messianism in the Polynesian islands with cargo cults. We're not talking about messianism among American Indians with black elk or something. Because these movements don't have the body of text that the Hebrew Bible offers. And it's that body of text that makes this work. Uh, Wise is looking for a word and he comes up with scripture prophets. I don't like it. I told him I don't think that's strong enough. Scripture prophets. What's that? But what he means is a prophet who's primarily driven by finding himself within the text of scripture. So what he means I think is okay. I just would like a better title for it. And I couldn't give him one so that's what he used. At the very outset the misgivings which must be raised as to the historicity of the predictions speak against this attempt. In addition, the tradition of Jesus' sayings reveals no trace of consciousness on his part of being the servant of God of Isaiah 53. The messianic interpretation of Isaiah 53 was discovered by the Christian church and even in it not immediately. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, I end up on the side of the conservatives and the evangelicals, but not because I think Jesus heard a voice and God said, I think you should die for the sins of the world because you're the Son of God, but because he read scriptures and found himself within those texts. And I think that's a much more believable scenario. I, I might have heard voices too, but uh, I just think it works. My own study of the messianic self-identity of two contemporary messiahs, namely David Koresh, 1993 Waco, and Moses Gabori, 1926 Jerusalem. The latter you've probably never heard of, but he's really, really amazing. He's the first Messiah of the modern period. Judaism doesn't have many after, after Bar Kokhba. They kind of get burnt on the Messianic enterprise, like, let's don't do that again. So we have Sabbatai Tzvi, and then we have Gabori. And Gabori almost convinced Rav Cook that he was it. He lived in a cave. Uh, Arthur Kessler came to visit him. He was the who's who of Jerusalem in the 1920s. And uh, he claimed to cause the earth. There was an earthquake in 27, wasn't there anybody? No, really major earthquake. And he uh, ended up uh, living in New York wearing a business suit and, you know, living off the ties of his followers, I guess. Uh, one of the things he did that was in scripture is he took another man's wife because in Hosea it says, take this woman who's married to a man and an adulteress and be with her and have children. So he goes, you know, this is me and I'm supposed to take you. So you can see the possibilities of finding yourselves in these texts, especially if you're reading <laughs> Hosea chapter 3. Uh, he's also told, go to the, pro to the prophetess Gomer. Uh, or to the, whether she's, I don't remember now if she's a prostitute, but at least. So the idea here is that there are certain texts within the Hebrew Bible, many of them are in Isaiah, Deuter Isaiah, 
And I want you to notice the language. You might not have ever seen this. Look at this, Isaiah 48, verse 16. I actually learned this from David Koresh uh, after he was dead. I mean, I read all his stuff and listened to him. I had never seen it either. You know how you read over text and you just don't notice? Once you notice, it's all over the place. This one will blow you away. Draw near to me and hear this. From the beginning, I've not spoken in secret. This is God talking, I think, or maybe it's the prophet. From the time it came to be, I have been there, and now the Lord, Adon, uh, Jehovah, or Yahweh, has sent me and His Spirit. Now there, the speaker sort of sounds like God, and if you read the verse before, it is God. But he says, I've been there from the beginning. It's actually the Spirit speaking. What the Ebionites say, and they have this, I think they really preserve this thought is the Holy Spirit hastens through the ages, trying to la land on somebody, to rest, uh, like the dove rests. When it says the Spirit rested on Jesus like a dove, it doesn't mean a bird came out of the sky. It means the Spirit came down like this, and then landed on Him, and made its nest in His hair, so to speak, metaphorically. So the Spirit hastens through the ages. It's the same Messianic Spirit, it's actually the spirit of Yahweh. It, if you have this level of anointing, you are Yahweh on earth. But where Christians kind of get this mixed up is then you exalt the person. The person is a human being, born of a woman. They'll die, they'll rot in the grave. They're not to be worshipped. But while they have the spirit, you're worshipping that manifestation. Or I shouldn't say, you're directing your attention to that manifestation of the spirit. But it can leave into thy hands I commend my spirit. Or, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't mean, why did you let me die? Like everybody, why would Jesus say that? It's a uh, giving up of that, so that now you die as a human being. It's based on Psalm 22. So who has had this? I'm talking about the Ebionites. This is not my view. I am not giving you my own views, my own understanding of these texts. Uh, the, so the Spirit hastens to the ages. Well, Moses certainly would have it. If you're anointed by the Spirit and you anoint others, in other words, you're not anointed by someone, but you're an anointer, then you, you have this sort of high level. And so notice that language again. So before the time it came to be, I've been there, and now the Lord God has sent me and His Spirit. Okay, look, listen to this one. Isaiah 49, verse 1. I want you to notice the language of the you and the I. Who, you always have to ask when you read these texts, who's speaking? Who's the I and who's the you? Because it switches. Listen to me, O coastlands, and hearken. This is one of the servant songs. You peoples from afar, Jehovah call me from the womb. If you wonder why I say Jehovah, because I think it's a better pronunciation, even though everyone on earth disagrees with Yehovah will is was, the one who will be and is and was. Anyway, Yahweh called me from the womb. From the body of my mother he named my name. This is, imagine somebody reading this and going, I think that could be me. I felt like all my life I was destined. There's a psychology that's very powerful. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. I know Jesus is following this because he forbids people to speak or tell what he's done in the Gospel of Mark. Some people would say that's a Mark and literary motif because of this text, I don't think it is. He doesn't think the secret should be revealed until a certain time. And so notice, uh, he, he hides me away. There's also another text that says, a bruised reed he will not break when he walks by, and uh, so forth. It's the same idea, this sort of stealth Messiah. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. Well, Israel's the servant, but now this guy is said, you're the servant. But I said, I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity, yet surely my right is with uh, Yahweh and my recompense with my God. And now Yahweh says, who formed me from the womb to be a servant 
to bring Jacob back to him, and Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of Yahweh, and my God has become my strength. And he says, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, restore the preserved of Israel? So you've got to pick Jesus and other people, Jesus at the center, because we have a lot of texts. He's reading this text and finding his mission. Uh, Isaiah 11 is the same way, remember, uh, the Lord has anointed me and I'm going to preach good news to the poor and the meek. So what does Jesus say right off the bat? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, right out of Isaiah 11. And it's, it's a sort of self-fulfilling thing. And here he says, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Uh, this one is really interesting here, Isaiah 50 verse 4, the Lord Yahweh has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him that is weary. Morning by morning he wakens, he wakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. So this guy's being taught by God. Every morning at 3 a.m. he starts hearing things and he gets revelations and he gets guidance. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear. I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So how could Jesus know what's going to happen? He can read Isaiah. So he says, we're going to Jerusalem. They will arrest me, spit upon me, strike me. It's written right here. So he's, he says, I'm this guy, and so this is going to happen to me. So um, I'm not denying that the authors, particularly Mark, who builds up the passion narrative, uh, ever uses any prophetic text to kind of frame events. I'm not going to go that far. But I would say Crossan is as far wrong as you can get over to one side, meaning nothing ever happened historically. It's all textual, right? Everything's textual. And I'm way over at the other side saying 99% of it did happen. And yes, it's textual, but it's textual before the fact. So did Jesus ride down the Mount of Olives on a donkey? Absolutely, yes. Why? Because he's pantomiming Zechariah 9, 9. Behold, your king comes to you. Uh, lowly and humble riding upon a donkey. I don't see why that needs to be after. He also predicts, as I said yesterday, the destruction of the temple. Why? Because he can read Daniel 9. And the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That can't be the first temple because it's written after the return from exile. And so anyone with eyes can read and say a, a prince from the west is going to come like an Antiochus type figure and he's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. It probably originally did refer to Antiochus, but in the late Second Temple period, they're reapplying it uh, because what happens with the book of Daniel is you have many, many references as uh, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 and Daniel 11, Daniel 12, that do refer to Antiochus and the persecution of the Maccabees, but then the end didn't come. So if the end didn't come, like read the last of Daniel 11 and 12, another guy Antiochus-like has to come, and that one, Antiochus then would just be a type or an example of the kind of guy, just so you can recognize him. He'll do certain things like Antiochus Epiphanes did, you follow? But it won't be him because he came and went and was defeated, and actually they set an, up an independent Jewish state for 100 years. Well, that's not what Daniel says. Daniel talks about the trampling for many days and finally the judgment and resurrection of the dead in Daniel 12. So if you're, if you're not going to throw those texts out and just say they're wrong, you have to reapply them to a future situation. So it doesn't surprise me at all that Jesus would do this. In fact, it's, it's also in the scrolls. So the scrolls have thrown such light on the enterprise of pressure making of taking texts that originally applied to certain situations, reapplying them in your present situation, and in the case of a figure, personalizing them so that you actually have your own autobiography written, including the emotions. If you notice, these texts have personal emotions. I say, Lord, 
how can I do this? It's too much. And the Lord answers me back. Oh, you think that's too much? You can't gather the tribes of Israel? Actually, I intend to have you bring the whole world back. It's like, it's a little bigger job. <laughs> so you picture Jesus saying, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Uh, so I, because of this, uh, this element, this possibility, I'm leaning more and more with my, with my buddies who hate me, like, like Ben Witherington and all, uh, that, that half of what we have, Jesus said, he probably did say. You know, I mean, I think there's some things that he didn't say, but I, I just think too much has been thrown out. But not because I think he is unique. I think it's part of what these figures do, is they find themselves in, this, in these texts. So the making of a Messiah is a complex process, but within the context of late Second Temple Judaism, or any subsequent figure who is very, very wedded to the text of the Hebrew Bible, or even the book of Revelation, which can now be thrown in for Christians, and can find within those texts a self-identity, a self-identification. Uh, I think, given, given those realities, uh, that we can understand how, how this could work. It definitely worked with Koresh. Uh, he was finding all sorts of things that fit the siege at Waco in the Bible. And they were pretty uncanny, actually. I mean, you read, these things often fit in a strange way, and I don't think we should be amazed at that. It's because the text, as you saw, you have a liar, and you have enemies who smite you. Well, doesn't everybody, you see? So they're generic enough that they fit. And then there's a generally singular task, like gather the tribes of Israel, bring light to the nations, establish peace and justice and righteousness in the earth. So like your job is already written, your job description. And in this case, if you, if you include the suffering motif, which is all over these texts, I mean, why leave that out? Why assume Jesus is the first guy who ever said, oh, but the guy who suffers and is spit upon, that, nobody's ever thought of that. I guess that's me, when the Qumran teacher was also reading the same text. Notice this quote here from the Habakkuk Pesher, the chastisement of the teacher of righteousness. The ch and it's a very strong word. The amal, it's actually a word from Isaiah 53, the suffering of the teacher, and the faith of the followers. Now, look at this paragraph. Most common in this complex of categories, candidates, and contexts. Don't you love those C's? I worked hard on this. <laughs> categories, and then people come along and go, that's me, that's me, I'll be this, I'll be that. And context, you have to have some sort of context in which it could work is the notion of a kind of realized eschatology, to borrow a phrase from C.H. Dodd. In other words, the hard reality of history is mediated by the imaginative projection of communal or individual self-understanding. The Romans are surrounding Jerusalem. They're going to destroy it. But at the last moment, what does Zechariah 14 say? In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives you know, and the enemies are going to be defeated, but it didn't happen. So what do you do? You say, well, it wasn't that siege, it'll be another one in the future. But you don't say that easy. It takes like a generation to deal with the shock of the failure of what you expected. The full confirmation of prophetic fulfillment is always at hand, just out of reach. Uh, but the serendipitous and fortuitous nature of events, as well as the self-conscious activities of the leader in the group, work together to construct a convincing picture. Although the texts themselves act powerfully in this mix, it is the utter conviction of the candidate set in these historical contexts that furnishes the ap apologetic power. With such dynamics at work, we truly have the makings of Messiah in ways that can be documented down through history and even into our own time. So uh, my understanding is that Jesus, uh, in my book, what I suggest, and I don't know this for sure, but what I suggest is that, when John, that he's not expecting this all his life, like from age two when he was nursing, he wasn't thinking someday I'll be on the cross. But when John was killed, 
he's just utterly devastated because they're supposed to work together and bring the kingdom and now the main guy that anointed him and chose him is gone. And the gospels seem to reflect this. It says he went away into a quiet place. Now I'm just, I don't know all of this. this is, I have to try to imagine, right? And I'm imagining that he was able to find a text about somebody being struck with the sword because John was beheaded. And I think the text he found was that Zechariah text. Strike the, she strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And oh, it says, awake, awake, O sword, against my servant. And why do I think that? Because Mark records that Jesus says to the disciples, yes, Elijah did come, but he suffered all that was written of him. So somewhere, Mark has a tradition that Jesus thought there's something written of a guy and he's supposed to get beheaded. Seems to me that's the best text. Mark does not like that because he wants Jesus to be the shepherd, not John. And so he inserts it at Gethsemane. Well, you can have two shepherds struck, but look, it says, awake, awake, O sword, against my servant. And Jesus was crucified. So Jesus actually fits another chapter in Zechariah. They will look on him whom they pierced, which probably refers to Josiah, we think, but, you know, who's pierced at, at the battle with the Egyptians. But he's still a Davidic figure, pierced. So you see how Christians could begin to read that. That's quoted, I think, in the book of Revelation, isn't it? They'll look on him whom they pierced and mourn for him as you mourn for an only child. And uh, so there, there are plenty of texts. You don't have to hog the one that's about the sword because there'll be one about piercing. Uh, so somehow there's a mix between the consciousness of the figure, the texts that offer all these possibilities, and then the context in which these figures work. The problem, of course, is the context is always historically open-ended and it can surprise you. Because you could think that ABC is going to happen and then CDF happens and you didn't think that would happen. But in terms of belief systems, you usually, prophecy never fails. You were wrong, the prophecy was right. So Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons and others who are indigenous apocalyptic groups have learned the skill of going back to the drawing board, reassessing and recalculating, not just dates, but also situations. And I've studied this material on the side. My field is really late Second Temple Judaism and early Christianity, but because I see such parallels in the enterprise of prophetic prediction, I've studied these other groups as well. If there's enough disappointment for over 50, 150, 200 years, what the group does, if it stays coherent, is they tend to drift away from literal predictions and move towards a more, you know, we know it's coming, but there's a sense in which it comes every day. And it's already here, but it's not fully realized. That's called realized eschatology. And that's what you see today with the Adventists. They still have prophecy conferences and all that. But they've set so many dates that have been wrong, Jehovah's Witness the same way, that the tendency would be to say, you know, we think probably it will be in our generation, but who knows? And then they quickly add, but it doesn't matter because we have to live for Christ every day. And he's already coming in the spirit every moment. So there's this tendency toward the Gospel of John. The hour is coming, yes, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who are dead will come forth and live. Realized eschatology is so seductive because it is not uh, falsifiable, right? Now, if you go too far with this, you get rid of the second coming at all as a literal event. And for that, you need to talk to N.T. Wright. <laughs> I'm following him very closely because he's Mr. Evangelical, but I sense that he, is this going to be on the tape? I could get in. I sense that he more and more is moving towards uh, allegorical interpretation of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. It's that, that's not the six feet tall or was he five seven figure popping out of the clouds so you could videotape it on CNN. But it's actually talking about a spiritual event that will come more and more in history. 
And that actually fits Daniel 7, who interprets the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven as the people of the Most High receiving power, glory, honor, and so forth. Not as a figure coming, you know, as the Son of Man is the people, and coming in the clouds of heaven means that they're empowered by God. That sort of interpretation works better for communities because it doesn't lead to disappointment. You, know, you can live your whole life, in effect, saying, whatever literally is going to come will come, but in the meantime, it's here. We call it already, not yet. You've got to say that fast. It's already here, not yet. It's not yet here, already. Uh, that's, this is the tension of the Gospel of John. It's a great solution, really. The other solution is just throw the, thing, the whole thing out and forget it, uh, which often happens also, where people just give up. Uh, but... Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Crossan, we should talk about Crossan, since he's the foremost interpreter of all of this stuff in, in the world, I guess, uh, next to Bart Ehrman. <laughs> Bart would agree with me, I think, uh, except on the prediction. But, it, I mean, he would agree more with, uh, they really thought it was going to come, and, you know, it didn't. And so Bart likes to leave all the pieces on the floor bleeding and just walk away. <laughs> it's your problem. You know, I was like that once too and worried about it, but now I'm a happy agnostic. But Crossan is a believer. <laughs> so he would say, don't look for those literal fulfillments. The only fulfillments are the realized present. And so the kingdom of God is here. Christ is coming every moment, fully and completely, whenever men and women, bond and free, get together when there's an egalitarian um, community of human beings working for peace and justice. How could you want Christ to come more than that? That is the coming of Christ. So, interesting, isn't it, the way people work out all this apocalyptic eschatology?